recording. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone, for coming along once again. Uh, this time for my talk about Rust and what we're doing in OpenSUSE and SUSE Links Enterprise and the past, present, and future. Once again, for people who uh, may be watching this on the recording or who are attending this and didn't see my talk the other day, who am I? My name is William Brown. I'm a senior software engineer here at SUSE Labs. In my day job, I normally work on identity management systems. So I work on a 389 directory server, which is one of the major open source LDAP servers. Uh, I also work on CunnyDM, which is an identity management project, and the WebAuthn library for Rust. Part of the reason why I may or may not have interacted with many of you is that I'm on the other side of the planet. Uh, I am based in Queensland, Australia, which means uh, that my preferred, well, my time zone is UTC plus 10. Um, and so sometimes the best way to get in contact with me is my email, and that is wbrown at suza.de. So first up, you know, what is Rust? Well, Rust is a modern systems programming language that wants to achieve performance, safety, and concurrency uh, without compromising on any of these three. And that's really interesting because I think that for a long time, people considered that you'd have to choose two of these three and you'd always have to sacrifice at least one of them um, when designing a programming language. So just have something which is trying to achieve all three is really good. There's been a lot of new programming languages that have been created or gained popularity in the last 40 years. Um, really notable examples that many of you would be familiar with would be, would be languages like Go, TypeScript and JavaScript, Java, C++, Ruby, Python, Haskell. Um, and they've all had their successes um, in their own areas. But no language that has been created has ever been able to displace C as the system programming language. And this lack of displacement really does come from a lot of different reasons. And they're unique to every language. But the fact still remains that C has been the only choice for a large number of applications. Rust is really exciting because it's the first time since 1978 that we actually have a language which could replace C as the system programming language. Rust is a compiled, runtime-free language with the ability to do strict C ABI compliance and memory layouts. However, unlike C, Rust brings a lot of modern programming improvements, such as inbuilt dependency management and build systems, uh, testing frameworks, uh, strong typing, um, and a whole bunch of other things to help with memory safety and security. Very similar to Go, Rust is statically linked rather than dynamic. And this is due to how the language works with a number of concepts internally, like generics. And so, you know, for the foreseeable future, there is not going to be dynamic libraries in Rust. I know that there are people who are going to say, oh, but there's an effort to add them. It's a long time away, if at all. Today, Rust, though, is already being used in a lot of projects. Um, just within OpenSUSE alone, it is a dependency of about 50 different projects uh, in OpenSUSE. And that number is still growing. And some of these aren't small either. Notable examples are RAV1E, which is a media decoding library, and RAV1E itself is depended on by 660 other packages. Mozilla Firefox, one of the major web browsers that we ship, you know, the browser is using Rust in a number of really important areas throughout its code base. 389 Directory Server, which is what I work on, is now using Rust in a number of its cryptographic and um, dynamic plugin areas. And there's librsvg, which is used in GNOME and um, other desktop and graphical environments as well. So these are like some high visibility areas that you know, Rust is being used in. And even now, there's already talk uh, of Rust becoming part of the Linux kernel. And this is really interesting because this is the first time that a second language has ever been even near considered by the Linux kernel project. Um, for being part of, you know, that, um, for, for being part of that project. For a long time, it looked like it would be C forever. But even just outside of code, 
From the Stack Overflow developer survey, Rust topped the list for the most loved language with an 87% approval rate. 14% of developers have first preferenced Rust as a language they want to use, only being beaten by Python, TypeScript, JavaScript, and Go. Um, and again, what's really important there is, you know, when we compare Rust with those others, Rust is the only one capable of those system level tasks that, you know, C has traditionally been able to do. There's also more than 10,000 JavaScript developers that want to start with or continue to develop their Rust skills. And this is, you know, evident by the way that um, both things like WebAssembly are evolving with something like Rust. So we'll be able to compile Rust into um, applications that run inside of browsers, but also that we'll see web developers potentially even using and developing more Rust-based backends for their web applications. So from all of this, we can see that Rust is really growing and it's only going to become more important to SUSE in the future. You know, it's already recognized as a goal by us as a company that we really need to be where the developers are at, developers are. And that way we can continue to provide them a platform that they can rely on and build. This applies to both our internal developers as well as our customers and external um, users who are looking at these technologies. And I think that we really need to be there ahead of this. So now that we've had a look at, you know, the importance of Rust, you'll probably be a bit surprised to know that from 2016 to 2021, Rust was almost completely community driven with very little SUSE presence at all. And it was actually mainly being driven by the Fedora community. Now that's not a bad thing. The Fedora community has many really smart and passionate individuals involved. It's more just that, you know, we have this really important technology which we probably should have had, you know, more interest uh, in. And, and it meant that, you know, just the way that Rust was being treated in OpenSUSE was much more adhering to the goals of what Fedora was doing rather than potentially the goals that we might have in OpenSUSE or SLEE. It's also really interesting to look at the ideas that this Fedora community um, was actually bringing to uh, this process and what they were bringing to uh, Rust and how it was managed inside of SUSE. They were really following this ideology of the distribution being at the center of everything. Um, but this was starting to create some rough edges. There was one thing which was that there was a single version of Rust for the whole platform. Um, and it was packaged in a really weird way. It had a lot of sub packages that hard required each other. So it created these pointless separations like Rust and Rust STD. You, couldn't, you can't use them separately, but they were separated packages and they depended on each other. And then you had things like RLS and Rust analysis where Rust analysis doesn't do anything without the Rust language server. So, you know, why are these separated out? Um, but it also broke out tools into smaller parts and removed functionality that people expected to exist. Um, it also made a lot of odd changes to the Rust compiler build process that made it look quite a bit different to what you would get if you got an upstream version of the compiler. Um, and so there was like a number of these like odd little packaging things. But I think the main issue really was how the community was approaching um, packaging of those leaf projects. So talking about things like um, RAV1E or BAT or um, things like that. Um, remember, Rust is statically linked. Um, and so all of the libraries that go into a Rust project are only build time requirements. Um, and very similar to something like Python or JavaScript or Node, there's a very large ecosystem that's community driven with hundreds, if not thousands of libraries available. And many projects, you know, will have 50, 100 of these libraries included. So it's a large number of very small libraries included into each um, eventually statically linked Rust application. The main build tool inside of Rust is called Cargo. And Cargo knows how to manage all of this for us. But the thing was that rather than rely on Cargo to do its job as that build system that managed all of these dependencies, um, the Rust, the, the macros that were being used by the community-driven project 
actually enabled a bunch of unsafe flags in the compiler that would pretty much cause any upstream who realized this to not support the resulting packages. So there are some hidden environmental variables, which if you pass to the Rust compiler, will unlock a whole bunch of uh, features that shouldn't normally be used in a production compiler. And they were enabling these for every single package that used their macros. Um, and, and of course, this could potentially lead to really subtle issues um, within uh, projects that were being built like this. But also, rather than use the Rust dependency management for these libraries, they were attempting to package the world. You know, shipping a source library package for every single Rust library that existed and you know these were only for those build time requirements and this kind of really goes against the grain of what the rust community is expecting but it causes a lot of issues for maintainers and users too if you go onto fedora today who is really strongly trying to follow this process and you search for just the keyword rust so if you do dnf search rust you get more than 9000 package results making it really difficult to actually find something that you might want let alone if you're a new user who just wants to say, you know, DNF install Rust, you know, how are you going to find it within this list? But it also meant like a huge amount of maintainer time to actually like feed everything in and take care of all of these things. And then of course, for the people who have these leaf packages, you have to adjust all of your build systems potentially to work with how this dependency injection process worked. Um, but there was also like some other like really subtle issues there as well in terms of package versioning, which basically uh, could cause applications to break in some situations as well. And so this is kind of where we were. We're at this like weird spot where we didn't really have any input to this growing technology. The approach was really being driven by distribution centric ideas and not Rust community developer ideas. There was a lot of resource intensive time for maintainers. Um, packages had a lot of work to do if they wanted to actually package anything. Um, there was a lot of subtle traps. Um, but, you know, especially for us, one of the big sticking points, especially for SUSE, was that single version of Rust. And it may not seem like a bad thing from the outside, but within SLEE, we're actually pinned to 1.43 for a long time because of the requirements of Firefox ESR even though it's a build-only dependency, it required 1.4.3, so we couldn't actually upgrade to a new version. So let's fast forward to today. The community uh, in the Rust group in SUSE's had a shift, and uh, it was decided that I would step up and become the primary maintainer. Uh, so since then, I've done a lot of developer engagement with people who work with Rust inside of and outside of SUSE, and have been refining how we approach a lot of these um, tools and parts. One of the really critical ones is how we're managing libraries in Rust projects. Um, rather than the package the world approach, uh, Rust is capable of vendoring or bundling all of its dependencies at source check in time. And of course, this always raises the immediate concern from people who say, security, we've got to secure these libraries. So I actually went and spoke with product security um, about this because, you know, there are going to be a lot of things inside of the Rust ecosystem where vendoring is unavoidable. Um, either that's due to customized build systems where those macros can't inject the dependency parts or just, you know, um, requirements that exist within that project that only the um, fixed versions in vendoring can provide. So, you know, we were always going to need to support this vendoring somehow. And so that meant we were always going to need to know how to do it securely. So I spoke with the product security team and um, worked with them about what we could or couldn't do. And so something that we've done is I've written a service for OBS, which allows um, a tool called Cargo Audit to actually look inside of all of those libraries that exist in a project to find dependent, uh, to find security issues that may exist. And this is um, done by the upstream Rust security team and they publish an advisory database, which we um, update frequently and then, um, Whenever someone is building and submitting a package into um, OBS, Cargo Audit can actually look through and say, hey, you, you shouldn't proceed with this because you've actually got these security issues in your project. You need, to up, you need to resolve them before you can actually commit to OBS. And of course, you know, generally people also then go, well, if we just fix the library in one place, then it just works with everything else. 
we don't need to go and re-vendor everything. But remember, Rust packages are statically linked. We were going to have to go and do this rebuilding anyway, regardless of all of this other stuff. So it's no extra demand on our infrastructure compared to before, same amount of compiler work. And it also actually ends up allowing better upstream collaboration because it means that we can start to push that security process of applying these fixes and these changes into the upstream projects rather than having every distribution trying to manage its own um, patched versions of libraries and um, uh, how they fit in with all of these different parts. We've also made it possible now to have parallel versions of Rust in our repository, similar to Clang and LLVM. This has already let us keep 1.43 in uh, for Firefox ESR while allowing us to now have a standing change order so that we can up, update Rust uh, to follow the upstream versions as they come out inside of Slee, so the six-week release cycle. And this applies to 15 SP2 and onwards uh, for everyone who's contributing inside the distribution. And it's actually quite interesting because without knowing it, uh, this had been requested by Rancher a long time ago, but I'd actually already begun the work and completed it by the time I'd learned of their request. Honestly, it's still not a completely smooth process. There are still a few bumps that need to be finished clearing up. Um, at the moment, we're still tend to lag a few weeks behind upstream, but it's much better to be in a position of lagging by one or two versions than 10 or 20. Um, and that gap will continue to shrink as we iron out issues. And at this point, I really want to shout out a massive thanks to Marcus Meissner and Dominique uh, is it Leuenberger? Sorry, I'm, I'm really bad with pronunciation. But Dominique, they've both been super patient, super helpful, and really supportive um, with this process. Um, and not a few minutes ago, I was actually talking with them about, you know, some issues that have just, just come up. And so, um, again, massive thanks to their help to actually get this uh, achievable. And of course, the exciting thing here is that actually, even with just these changes of just some the OBS tooling, um, improvements with the wiki documentation that we have, you know, there's parallel Rust versions. Um, there's already been a positive reception to this, both in the community and within SUSE. Um, and it's been really exciting to have multiple people just who I've never met before or spoken with before, who just contact me directly and thank me for some of these things. And, and you know, they're noticing some of these changes. And that's been, you know, really lovely. And it's a really great reflection of the, the people that we have here at SUSE and, you know, their, their attitude to, you know, thanking people in the community, but also, you know, it helps me feel good about, you know, wanting to keep doing this and make, helps me feel like I'm on the right track. But now we look to the future. So while it has been great to have smaller discussions about Rust and what we're doing, um, you know, and, and those discussions with like targeted developers or whatever, we need to really know how people are doing things much more broadly. Um, and I mean across like many different Linux distributions and operating systems. Because if, if we understand how people are using Rust, then, then we can know where to spend our energy. Um, and we can actually set up our Rust environment inside of OpenSUSE to match the way that people want to use it. And potentially, you know, if we do this in the right way, we may even be able to attract people to SUSE and OpenSUSE as the Rust Linux distribution. So how to get to this future goal? Well, to do this, we've recently completed the first Rust usage survey um, as part of the OpenSUSE organization. And I really want to thank uh, the people who helped me set that up. Um, and, and I helped, and I had help with, uh, from a local researcher who is from a local university in the psychology department for creating this survey. And I really appreciate um, her input and work to help, you know, improve and make this survey what it is today. Um, and we opened it up publicly and we advertised it a lot on social media. Uh, it went out via the official Rust Lang channels. There was some Rust Weekly news that advertised it. And so we ended up with a lot of data from across the board. Um, you know, Windows, Mac, Linux users. Um, we really wanted to know how people were using Rust so that we could make some decisions about where we put our energy in the future for Rust in SUSE. 
but also just aligning with what the community wants to do rather than working against it, I feel is going to be really important because that's a really major objective that we have, I feel, as SUSE as, as a group. So this survey, we received 1,360 responses, which is about 1,350 responses more than I thought I was going to get. Um, and that kind of number is excellent because it means that we can really get significant um, you know, we can make some really significant um, analysis and, and decisions about this. You know, it's not like very small numbers. And I think one of the things that, you know, we asked about was how people, you know, feel about Rust and if it's important to them. And very much echoing the sentiments of, you know, what I mentioned at the start with the, the Stack Overflow survey, you know, we see this this trend of the, the graph here that um, we're looking at where, from the left to the right, uh, the final column is no answer. There was a there was a number of non-answers in this section, but the trend is the majority of people are looking to it as very important and improving. Um, and and this was something that we saw is that once we moved on to uh, what do people think in the future, it became even more important again. But it's also really interesting to see what pro what platforms people are using Rust on as well. So we asked what as developers what platforms are they using Rust on while they're programming? And um, we asked Mac, Windows, Linux, or other. And in this, we've extrapolated the Linux only column based on people whose sole answer was Linux only. Um, and this is really interesting because, you know, it really shows that Linux is where a lot of Rust code is targeted to run on, especially while people are developing. And I think that it also is showing here that you know, while people may be programming on a, a Mac or a Windows machine, they are likely also doing that in parallel with a Linux environment where they're probably going to then transition that into their production environments. So Linux really is the, the place where Rust development will happen. And it will happen across multiple different distributions. There's very almost equal of the um, Mac, Windows, and Linux only usage here. The one that really surprised me though, uh, especially uh, once we filter into Linux only developers, um, was how people were installing their Rust tool chain. Um, I expected a lot more people to be installing from a package manager, but in fact, that's not the case. The majority of people overwhelmingly are using the upstream Rust tool called RustUp, with only a very small number of people actually using our distribution provided Rust for their development environments. And so this is really interesting because it means that, you know, as the package that we're shipping, it's less important that we're shipping developer tools because people just aren't using them. Um, the majority of people are using Rust up. When we start to look at how people want to manage their libraries as well, as mentioned before, we had the difference between the approach of package the world versus vendoring. When we look at um, people who want to uh, ship their Rust software in either a package or a container, um, the majority of people want um, the, the light green column here. They want the online download from Crates.io. And um, when we look at the packages, there's, there's a fair few who want distribution packaged Rust libraries, but then we see a lot of people who still want vendoring or bundling. And so, you know, we could almost consider that, you know, if we took away the ability to do online, everyone who was in the online column would probably move on to the vendoring column. And so overwhelmingly, we see that, you know, this is kind of showing that, um, you know, managing libraries internal to Cargo and how Cargo works internally, avoiding the package manager provided libraries is probably the way that most developers actually want to proceed. This is both as developers who are packaging their software for a distribution and people who are um, using it for um, containers. So even our own, you know, we even have this number of people who are doing packaging who want to um, use the, the Rust ecosystem natively. A really interesting one though, was how are people managing their security updates in their Rust dependencies? And I think this one was really exciting um, because we asked if people were using tools like Cargo Audit, which as mentioned, we've now integrated with OBS. Um, 
uh, not OBS, sorry, OSC. Um, so you can use it from the um, OBS service. Uh, Cargo Outdated, which just automatically updates everything in your um, dependencies so you can see what libraries are outdated and just update them. Um, if people were not actively following, if people relied on distribution packages, things like that. And again, what's really interesting here is that, you know, we have a huge amount of support, you know, 571 responses that were taking at least some steps um, to manage security versus the 126 that they don't actively follow. And this is awesome. This is 80% of the developer community are actually doing something about their security updates of their own, you know, initiative. And I think that's fantastic. And of course, just like um, vaccination, you know, this rate is always better the closer we get it to 100%. And the more that we can encourage people to use these tools um, is really awesome because it means that we can get people to keep um, getting closer and closer to that 100% of managing their own security lifecycle and just automatically doing it as part of their build processes. Um, it was also interesting here that the very small number that would use and get security updates relied on distribution package libraries. And again, I think this is really interesting in terms of showing that um, the Rust community tends to really want to do things in the Rust way rather than relying on those external library sources. Um, and, and it's very unlikely that we could force them to change over to our model of, of how we've done stuff as a distribution. Of course, there were many more questions than this, but this was just a few that I thought were interesting. Um, there's a much more complete report on my blog, which I've linked here. Um, I can also link it later in channels or whatever, but some of the key summaries is really interesting. It's just that, you know, developers are preferring Rust up to get their Rust tool chains over all other sources when they're doing development. Our distribution Rust packages are primarily part of a build pipeline. They're not landing on a developer workstation. It's something that is just installed as part of a container just to build their packages before they get deployed, or it's something that our, you know, we just use inside of OBS to build our Firefox releases or something like that. Developers, you know, really want to be using Cargo and its native features for library and dependency management. They they really aren't looking heavily elsewhere. And Rust developers are surprisingly proactive about doing updates and you know, ensuring the security of their libraries, which I think is really exciting. Of course, beyond this survey, though, there is still a lot more work that needs to go on. Um, you know, from that survey, we've started. I've started to make some changes to the Rust package uh, to reflect some of these results, and you know, still trying. You know, unfortunately, also got hit with an issue at the same time where libgit broke cargo, so that's delayed that unfortunately, and I'll be looking at that shortly. Um, but there's also uh, an effort with the product security team, again, where we're going to uh, automate the security checks of libraries in OBS. So we're talking about how we can, you know, do a weekly scan of cargo audit on everything in OBS that is using Rust and has library vendoring. And I think this is... Um, really good because it means that we can start to also then be proactive about contacting maintainers to either update their dependencies and, you know, be aware of that responsibility when they are doing vendoring. Um, but also it means that we can potentially end up finding if there are packages that are, you know, not being as effectively maintained or may need re-adoption or may need removal. Um, saying this, there has already been a lot of adoption of those OBS services for Cargo Audit, um, which has been really excellent to see that, again, people who are doing packaging are you know, following those best practice guides on the wiki and um, using those templates and actually just embracing those, you know, those safety checks before they check in. Um, another thing that you know, I need to start following up on is SCC cache. Um, this is similar to C cache for C, but it's Rust aware, so it can do Rust, C, and C++. Um, and I've already done a lot of the work to get this integrated with OSC and the OSC build shell scripts. Um, all of that's all done. I'm already using it here. So, you know, it speeds up my Rust compiler rebuilds from 40 minutes to six minutes, which is a 
huge amount of saving. So the next step will be talking to um, people who work on OBS to actually see if we can get this running in the production instances for things that, you know, use Rust, basically. Potentially, you know, depending on how it goes, SCC cache could even, you know, replace C cache, given it does the same thing. And of course, you know, one of the other really important things is that we need to keep working with the people inside of SUSE and outside of SUSE in our community and, you know, find out how people are using, you know, continue to engage with them about how they're using Rust, get that feedback, what those needs are, and make those decisions that are going to be, you know, best for our time and, you know, our goals. You know, some of the major ones, obviously, is things like Rancher. They have uh, a, bit of Rust, a fair bit of Rust code, as I understand it, and they were asking for Rust updates in SLEE so that they could then start to use our tool chains. Um, I've heard from some of the developers of Zipper that they are looking into adding Rust stuff. Uh, recently, I've been working with um, uh, on Andrew Andre Nikitin. I'm so bad with names. I'm so sorry um, about uh, mirroring and uh, using. And I've written a experimental uh, uh, cache for Zipper, which allows package mirroring to occur in a really lightweight way. You know, and of course, like the kernel team, if that continues to grow, I've already heard. Um, you know, from other people that there's there's a lot of interest from our own kernel developers within SUSE in, in Rust being part of the kernel. So that's exciting. And of course, you know, beyond just that, Rust is going to become more significant across the distribution. So it's going to be really important to make sure it's working well. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of the the time to be getting a lot of these these changes made so that we can, you know, keep making these changes before the consequences of, of breaking something become too great. And so, you know, I, I think that we're on like a really happy path and, and we're on a good path forward. Like we're aligning with what Suze's company objectives is. We've been, you know, really strong focus on the community and what developers want, um, you know, not forcing people into work patterns that they may not want. Like, you know, I really would love to get to a point where SUSE and OpenSUSE is the Rust distribution where people say, yeah, this is what you get if you want to have the best Rust experience as a platform you know, for your applications and things like that. So, you know, that would be a fantastic um, place for us to get to. Uh, and that's going to take, you know, more time and more work. But already, like, I'm super excited by the the progress that we've made and, and very encouraged by the feedback that I've already heard from so many people. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening to me once again. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit under time, but there is certainly time for some questions now, and I'm sure that there will be many. Uh, so I will now stop sharing my screen and get ready for those. So there have been a couple of questions. How oh, I can, oh, there's been a lot of talking. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So uh, the first question from Hannes was, uh, wouldn't it make sense to concentrate on containers, transactional updates for packages built with Rust? Um, I, I, I don't understand why that's right. any different. Like, like, we, so, like the problem is that, um, as you said, that Rust doesn't really support dy dynamic libraries. Yep. So, which means if we build Rust packages or Rust programs, they have to statically compile in the libraries they need. Yep. Which means if there are several of those, we have lots and lots of code duplication. Because everyone, no. every single program of that will have to pull in their own libraries and will ship with those libraries built in. So no chance of sharing anything there. Uh, it's, a, there it's a lot more complicated than that. Rust, especially when it's optimized, does a lot of dead code elimination. But also the other thing is that um, one of the reasons it has to build in is because of how generics work. So uh, I don't care know, why like, it's built in. The point yeah, is it's being uh, built in. But you can't deduplicate it either because it ends up being unique, potentially, yeah, sure. in a lot of ways. Sure, yeah. but still there will be code duplication because, well, the point of libraries is that they have lots and lots and lots and lots of common libraries. If they're having just uh, lots lots and lots of common functions, if these common functions turned out to be not common but rather unique to individual programs, point is why is there a shared library if it's not shared at all, right? Yeah, but then dead code elimination kicks in. Like, if you have a library with... 13 functions and one application uses three of them and another one uses a different three, then 
they will de- code eliminate each other. Sure, so, but like, this I don't is now the optimal the case is that here. everything like, is being eliminated. No, so what is I the question? Expect- okay, I'm sorry. So, right, okay. What so, is the question? But my point is, for transaction updates or containers, we have to ship the dynamic li- libraries by design for each container and each transaction update. When we do transaction updates, when we do containers, there is we can't share anything because containers have to keep keep everything they need. It needs to be within the container. Yeah. So, which means it's ideally suited for us, where we suited, where we where this is by design that we have to deliver everything. So okay. the yeah. my cre- the point of sharing doesn't really apply for containers because you can't share with containers. Yes, that I'm sorry. Where's the what's the question? So the question is why, so wouldn't this make Rust ideally suited for containers and not so much for real OS? Where again, the the problem of not being able to share dynamic libraries will kick in and hence we will have code duplication. I don't see, okay, so. I mean, this is the point why we have dynamic libraries in the first place, right? If we can't share no. dynamic libraries, you can as well leave it and don't do dynamic library, libraries. Your same argument is essentially the argument, well, you don't need to do dynamic libraries. You can just compile in static libraries and then everything would be nice. Because with normal libraries, I, we I, also only pick those functions which I'm we need from confused. those libraries. We're not building in the entire library. No, the I'm very confused why about why we're having why... dynamic libraries is that no, there is like... a code duplication to be had by having dynamic libraries. Yes, but I'm very confused about what is the problem that you're trying to solve? The like problem is to reduce space? this space. This space, yes. Okay. We live in the the year of our Lord, 2021. So, okay, put it the other way life. around. If disk space wouldn't be a problem, why do we bother with dynamic libraries at all? I don't know why we do. I don't think they're a good idea. They cause more headaches right. than okay. they solve. Pass it back to our <laughs> compilers, folks. So, like, it, like, that's the thing is I'm th- this, like, also, regardless of what we that... say about dynamic libraries, no matter what we, what, what, if, if, if the dynamic libraries were considered the, the perfect model, let's say that they were the greatest thing ever, like, let's go with that. That's not how Rust works. It, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't have them. We, yes. It's going to have things that are built in. They're statically linked. And it means that when an update happens, we have to rebuild those binaries and push them out. That's it. That's the. That's how it's going to work. Like transactional updates, yay or nay, it's. That's what's going to happen. And in terms of saving disk space, that's when you get the stuff like, you know, decode elimination, compression, all of that other stuff. Like there's a like. Yes, I agree with Ralph. I do not see what the problem is. I, I think that. I, I I do not understand. All right, so what I'm is probably the only one yeah. that cares. Oh, good, fine. Yeah, good. Okay, there's fine. nothing I mean, that I mean, can be changed here. Like this is how Rust works. Like it, you know, transactional yeah. updates or not, it's not gonna. So, um, but the but the other thing there is, if you um, the the other problem there is indeed security updates because for security updates on a shared library or on a library being used by by Rust programs, you have to ship out all of these programs. Which yes, will that's... incur, which means you will have to have more data for update. So there's a few different aspects there to that one. Uh, one okay. is that by you know just by the nature of it being Rust in the first place, there are significantly fewer security issues that are occurring. Seventy percent of security issues today, as analyzed by Microsoft and Google, are memory safety issues, and Rust basically eliminates these. So if we've already reduced our security, you know, let's say that we have 100 security updates in a month and we just like, we take that um, 70% there. Yes, Richard, I know about the unsafe keyword. Um, the, we've already removed, like we've already gone from 100 security updates to 30, right? We're already reducing that. And then this is, and then you start to get onto the stronger type system and stuff like that, which reduces human error and things like that. Like, if you can go and have a look at the rate of security defects that are coming out in the Rust security group. They're actually really transparent and very on their game about this as well. 
Um, and it's just like the rate at which defects are occurring is significantly lower. And that means that, yeah, we will have security issues, but we're reducing that um, through, you know, the way that the language works on its own. But yes, when a security is issue happens, we rebuild those things. And that is why I took steps to work with our product security teams because they would have this concern. And, you know, like when we have these problems, we're going to need to handle it because we can't avoid that vendoring will happen inside of Rust stuff. And so we need to do the responsible thing. So again, that's why we spoke to the product security team. How can we manage this? What can we do? How do we approach it? And, you know, from everything I've spoken with them, they are satisfied with the, what I presented here about how we can approach this. Okay, good. Yeah, like, and, you know, I, and I wanted to be proactive with, with them about that because like at the end of the day, like if our product security teams aren't happy with this, then we need to up our game as, you know, for me as the Rust maintainer. So, you know, and if they have concerns in the future, then I want to hear it from them. And that way I can improve things like. Okay. Yep. So we have another question from Giovanni. Yep. Why Rust doesn't do dynamic linking? Monomorphization of generics. So what that means is when you have a function which takes a generic parameter T is the, the general name for this. So you may have a library which exposes, you know, do something over this generic. It could be like a collection, like a hash map that stores a whole bunch of, you know, T type. When you're building that code, you don't know what T is. You don't know how to do a quality on it. You don't know how to hash it until you know concretely exactly what T is at that final point. And that final point can only occur when that library goes all the way up through and is built and linked with that final calling application at the top, which finally gives those concrete types that filters all the way down. And then what Rust will do is, it, is monomorphization where it says, okay, we've got the generic type and it's called in ABC locations with these types. And then, it'll emit basically three different hash maps optimized to those specific types. Um, and of course, then of course they have unique symbol names and things like that because those, um, yes, it's exactly like templates in C++. Um, it, it's, it's very, very similar in concept. That was a comment in the chat, by the way, that's why I'm pointing at the screen. Um, but yes, it's about how it goes from here is one function to compiling multiple unique instances. And what's also important to remember here is that because of the way that Rust works internally, uh, you can turn on strict C struct layout compliance so that it will do the same allocation memory layout rules as C does. But if you don't do that by default, a struct can change in between say two different compiler versions or whatever. And so you need to recompile every time based on different compiler versions, based on how that structure is going to be laid out and how that's sized and all of that stuff. So this is why basically it all has to be compiled in is because of these concepts that Rust, you know, embeds into itself. Okay, those are the questions that I have uh, saved from yep. the chat. If there's more. There, there was one about, um, it's, you know, people have spoken about unsafe and stuff like that. Um, Yes, so often people will look at Rust and go, oh, but it has an unsafe keyword that turns off all the rules. And it's like, well, no, all of the Rust rules are still there. You still have to uphold everything the compiler wants you to do in terms of lifetimes and all of that. All unsafe lets you do is dereference pointers and call other unsafe code. And those that's the only two rules. You still have to ad adhere to everything else. now. Once you start dereferencing stuff, yes, you can break lifetimes. Yes, you can change and swap um, memory layouts. Yes, you can update global statics because you can then write to pointers because you're dereferencing stuff. But those are the only two changes. And what's important here is that first, as the unsafe keyword exists, it becomes really easy to go through a code base and say, hey, where is the unsafe keyword? And let's make sure we audit that code really carefully so that it doesn't break everything else. And second, it means if you have a code base that has no unsafe, then there are a large number of strict rules that apply, which cannot be broken during, you know, runtime without, say, like, 
external intervention or hacking or, you know, cosmic radiation bit flipping things. So, you know, it's really good just in terms of, hey, you're doing a security audit and you've got 100,000 lines of code. Well, now we can look at these parts because they're probably suspect and we can see the bits that call those parts and see if they're suspect. And it gives you an area to really carefully audit. Whereas if you look at a C code base, it's unsafe from start to finish. You may as well just assume that the entire C code base has an unsafe wrap around the whole thing because C is, you know, fun as many of us here, I hope would understand. Um, and that's fun with Australian sarcasm laden on. Um, and so like, that's where unsafe, like even though it exists, it's actually a very powerful tool because it lets us find that suspect code and make very um, like careful auditing decisions around that. There's even some projects that actually, and rules inside of some Rust libraries about denying unsafe code to prevent it from being compiled in at all. Um, again, to try and avoid this kind of potential for memory safety issues, which as previously mentioned, are 70% of security issues 